please join me in warmly welcoming our speaker, Chris Packham. I come in fear for all humankind. I come in fear for all humankind. Not as a messiah, <laughs> but as a messenger. Because that's my job these days. That's the job that some of you have given me. And I'm very grateful for that. I'll take a moment to say thank you for giving me that job. It's a job that sometimes sees me shot at. They always say, don't shoot the messenger. But my adversaries have never listened to that. Thankfully, I've got quite thick skin. But um, my role now, not just within television, but outside of that, is to transfer knowledge and fact and information from one source to another to precipitate productive progress. That's something that I take very seriously because I need to do it with enormous urgency. But it's always been a privilege to be a, a messenger too, and my career goes back, um, well, if that's what you call it, uh, goes back to the mid-80s when I started making The Really Wild Show. I grew up in a three-up, three-down, looking at National Geographic. I never dared dream that I would visit some of those locations. That's where my gratitude comes from to some of the people here who facilitated that. And to paraphrase one of my favourite movie lines of our era. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. I've seen humpbacks breaching off the shoulder of Cortez. I've seen cheetahs hunting gazelle at dawn off the Musiara Gate. But my question is, will all of these things be lost in time? Like tears in rain. <coughs> or can we save them from that time to die? And I think the question is valid to this audience because we have enormous power in this room to make a productive difference. And our consciences need to be satisfied that we are making and we will make those differences. So, in a unconventional lecture, certainly unconventional for me, I'm going to do um, something a little unusual. Um, I've written you all a story. Yeah, I've sat down and toiled over my keyboard and written you a story. So I'm going to read you the story, and then we're going to have a look at a clip that I made recently on location. I'm going to segue directly into that clip, and the clip will run for about 15 minutes, and you'll know when it finishes because it will say the end in white letters on the screen. <laughs> it's pretty simple. So without further ado, I'm going to read you, my, read you my story. Here we go. I hope you're sitting comfortably for the moment. He will pitch precariously over the top of the ladder at the peak of the Thousand Bund, and as he does so, his last fingernail will break off and float out and away like a flake of fire ash. He'll pull down his UV and squint after his scale, watching it spiral on the salty updraft until that precious little piece of him softly melts into the smog and vanishes. All of the younglings will lose their nails, most will shed their hair and many of their teeth by the time they'll be his age. He will be 14. The descent was dangerous. The rung swung loose and rusty and the wind smacked his face and tore at his smock for the long hour that he spat the brine and drank the tears that streamed from his sea-stung eyes, clambering down a speck on that sheer face of steel and stone. He dwelt in the shade of this great dyke and at certain times when the grinding of the colossal tides quietened, they knew the waves had sunk 
and the bravest of the well-fettled made this journey to try and see the sun. He saw the old fishering man as soon as he landed on the naked shore, far out beyond the litter slick, bent forward with his fisher stick, blobbed with great clots of spindrift, knee-deep in the brown slosh, staggering to stand on the sand on that edge of the sea's land. The figure lurched in the spume and he wondered again at his desperation. The ancient fool with his ancient fisher tool, tugging its line through a fishless ocean with some hell-bent redemptive notion. The base of the Bund bore the work of the Priyas, those with memories of all the gone things. Tattooed there in tableaus of wave-worn paint were a menagerie of fantastic fables Slippery shaped blue and grey creatures with giant swimming arms, with huge spouts of steam boiling from their backs, smooth and sleek. Some leaping clear of frothy white water, others bent beneath with their babies curved beneath their tails. He gazed through the fog at murals of shining fish and traced his fingers over the mottled bodies of eight legged devils with bulging eyes and he found 20 tiny buttons, prettily banded in orange and white, peeping from a tangle of ropey fingers nestled in a jumble of violet and yellow-green rocks. The paint had long peeled. These were the fading myths from the time of trees. Years before, his mother had taken him to visit the tree. His father and brother had just died in the third famine and his sister had vanished before the Gretchi had come. they transported all day and despite the fact they'd tokened their units, the line of pilgrims was so long they turned back, only having paused in confusion of the monument's silhouette. Smaller than they'd led to be believe, the tree was broken into a wicked tangle, twisted, painful and sad. He blinked and squinted to spot what the mutterers said were real leaves, and those sickly smudges behind the rain-soaked plastic shroud were all he could remember of the world's last tree. Except that it was on the transport back that the hoax about the bird had been used, and the whole world screened in to follow the search. Nothing was found. They all knew the birds were gone. Not even his father had seen a bird. The fishering man staggered up the beach, rolling in the surf, broken by the sea and betrayed again by his half-witted hopes. So the boy trudged down and helped to drag him roughly across the plastic shore, filthy and stinking of the sea sludge, foaming from the mouth, retching against the poisons, his hands raw, pinkened with sores and blotched with rosy bleeds. He disentangled him from the coils of his fishering stick, which danced spitefully in the gale and snapped on the rocks as the afternoon began to rot. As on every other of his adventures, over the Bund, the sun was not going to show. There was no horizon. A thin, rusty strip lay where the slimy beige water blurred invisibly with the greying, mud-coloured sky. And soon, a long, clammy night swallowed the two fugitives as they crawled into a cave at the foot of the rampart. He began shivering, and the fishering man began vomiting. He spewed three times. The first brought forth his last meal of cud, the second a froth of bitter pus, and the last a splash of blood, clots of which rubied his matted beard. In the howling gloom, as they shook and spat, the fishering man fictioned him that he'd watched the Priyas artisting the ramparts when he was a youngling. They'd come in floaters from the outside. They were ancient, but they had good fettle. They brought ladders and papers with artistry on them, and they'd copied the gone things onto the grey slabs in swirls of brilliant colours. They'd had names for all of those ghosts, and he'd forgotten all but one. Whales. The biggest monsters in their bestiary were called whales, and one of the Priyas facted that she'd seen them living. 
She'd storied the younglings that the whales lived in the sea but breathed from the air, that they transported all around the oceans, deep downing, and had a secret language of beautiful songs which they sang in warm blue waters, that they could leap into the sky, and had families and tribes, and they lived for hundreds of years. She storied that the Priyas first murdered these whales for food, then broke their ears, and then fed them plastics until they rotted inside out and all died. She storied that there were once so many different gone things that no one could count them. And she'd shown them her skin, which was painted with many fabulous creatures. The Priyas smiled and called her the Library of Life. And they'd circled around her naked body, crazily naming all her artistries, whilst the younglings chinked in awe and wonder and cried again, again, again. And so she stoyed until the sky went out and everyone stared up at their fresh glowing frescoes in silence. And the Priyas promised to return and they packed their floaters and went out smaller and smaller. That night, and for five more, there were great storms and no one ever saw those Priyas again. The morning air was thick and still and when he scaled the wall he was giddy with tiredness and hunger so rested frequently, hanging on the steel, his eyes closed, listening to his gasping heart. Halfway up his ascent, the beach was still visible and he watched the tiny fishering man wrestling with his stick and striding out through the dreck, stumbling and rising until he reached the ribbon of oily scum where he cast his line baited with his puke into the barren sea. Beyond him, he could see the carcasses of the final floaters, buckled and slumped, jumbled and lumped, their bodies rent, all dressed in the mess of the plastic spent by the Priyas. They had killed everything. The gone things, his father, his brother and sister, the sea, the air, the land, the birds, the whales. Only the fishering man's hope and his grip on the ladder were beyond their hateful curse. He ached. Every cell in his body was groaning in relentless agony. He'd survived the sixth famine, but the seventh was going to kill him. He'd had no Gretchy for two weeks, and his cracked lips had drained the last of his water five days ago. It was silent, apart from his failed door softly knocking and his ransacked room was revoltingly hot. They'd either all left, or they were dead. He was alone in his cot, sweating, itching, coughing and lying in his stinking shit and piss. Every time he turned, he'd crack the skin of his mess and choke on the stench. The rind peeled from his sores and the agony snuffed out his consciousness. He woke for the last time in a twilight, and listened to his scratchy breaths. And when he summoned the courage to draw open his scratchy eyes to see, he could no longer discern colour. He recognised this as the point of his death. And his last thought did not come randomly. He'd been dying slowly enough to have prepared for this moment. And so he recalled his final climb in search of the sun. All those years ago when he had the fettle to scale the bund and sneak down to the beach. On the way up he'd been smothered in the smoke from the pyres of burning dead. The sweep of the spotty sickness had been thorough and thousands of younglings were dying. Too many too quickly to transport. So they set them alight outside their homes each dawn. And when he'd pushed on clear of the fatty stench of searing flesh He'd perch for a while on the dizzy top of the parapet and surveyed his world. The foreground had been speckled orange and flowed lazy grey with the fires fuelled by the burning younglings. The smoke rolled, softly veiling the black and brown sub-city slums. Long lavender ribbons that thinned to a stupor in the east where their star should have risen but where the light never set. 
That's where the everglow of the mega blocks and all their power thirst bloomed orange, fat and heavy, with flickering lines of light. The lines where the lucky lived their lucky lives of luck, in the thickest of the muck, where everything was stuck, ground down, in brown town, in meltdown. It was there that the millions had swarmed whilst the world warmed, huddled close to their uninformed and denied deformed desire to hide out in the anti-worlds, those concrete closets where they nurtured their skeletons and locked their truths away to roll and knead the greed and quash the need of those who sought to intercede, denied extinction speed and now knelt captive, helpless before their machines. Outside, the scum, the sweat and flesh, the lumpy ugly, the fungus eaters, the gretchy sick and hungry swarmed in futile starvation furies in their slump of sprawl, dirty and thick, moronic and sick, born to die and just waiting, wasting and waiting to be waste. The fishering man had disappeared a few weeks later, presumably drowned or fallen from the ladder and been sucked away in the gloop. The boy had cautiously checked the cave, expecting the reek of a corpse, and there were signs he'd rested there. A pillow of plastic and the torn sheets he'd clothed himself in. Handprints in the sand, the prop where he'd rested his fishing stick, and the signs of a small fire. A blackened circle of sand, and close by, a scattered pile of tiny flakes. Silvery, shiny, glistening, as if the old man had pulverised some glass. They sparkled emerald and sapphire in the light, and shone bright grey in the shade. He flicked them, and they floated and flashed, glittered and coated his finger in a shimmering crystal skin, a dust of diamonds. He twisted his hand, and a deep smile came out of him as he loved their pretty twinkling. He sniffed them, oily and salty, with a warm, bitter sting, like nothing he'd ever smelled before, nor ever smelled again. And as his heart will stop, and as this last moment of his life lingers on his final breath, he'll realise he'll realise that those beautiful scales had come from the skin of a fish. He'll realise that the fishering man's determination and persistence had meant that his enduring hope had been fulfilled. Then he'll sigh, his lungs will collapse, and for only the second time in his life, he'll smile from deep inside and then he will die. He will be 31. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that was all science fiction. That was a bit of... Um, Blade Runner, a bit of Mad Max, a bit of District 9, a bit of Oblivion in there, wasn't there? But I say that that actually might be a bit of science fact. So what is fact? Well, fact is something that we take when we imbue it with authority. It's something that we normally establish through impartial and independent research. And when it comes to the climate, we've got some good facts because we've got some good impartial independent research. You see, out there are a bunch of scientists with state-of-the-art technology, massive computers, and a high degree of intelligence. And they've been looking at the climate. And we call them the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And they've given us 10 years to sort out this issue. And I believe them because of their impartial science. And I'm frightened of that target because we don't seem to be making much progress. 
And it's not just the climate. We've got another bunch of scientists out there, the conservationists, the environmentalists, and they've had their fingers firmly on the pulse of the world's wildlife populations for a long time, looking at the changes in distribution and population size. And we know that since 1970, we've lost somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the world's wildlife. We know that in the UK, one out of every seven species is in danger of extinction. And 50% of those species are in decline. We are one of the most nature depleted countries anywhere in the world. And we're part of that ecology on this planet. And to a great extent, we're dependent upon it. So that collapse in biodiversity is equally terrifying. And then we've got another big problem. There's an awful lot of us humans. At the moment, the UN, and I believe they're scientists too, tell us that there are 7.7 .7 billion humans on planet Earth, and by 2050, there could be 10 billion people here. Well, what are the repercussions of that sort of population increase? Let's just think about the present. If everyone across the world consumed at the same rate that we do in the UK, we would need two extra planets worth of resources just to sustain us now. If everyone in the world consumed at the same rate as people do in North America, we would need four extra planets today just to sustain our population. We're using up so much stuff so quickly. All of our technology, all of our phones, our flat screen TVs, all of our clothes. That's with 7.7. .7. What about 10? What are the resources we might be worried about then? Well, I beg to imagine that they might be food, water and fresh air. And we've known about this for some considerable time, but we haven't been doing much about it. So let's ask ourselves, what have we been doing about it? We that make environmental and natural history TV programmes. Well, for most of the last 30 or 40 years, we've been making bits of the world look like paradise. Absolute utopias. We go to places, there were never any people there, Everything's functional. Everything is beautiful. OK, we've excited people. We've fascinated people. We've shown them things that they could never, ever have dreamt of. And they have fallen in love with that environment through awe and wonder and affinity. But has their love actually transferred into making a real difference? Well, no. Of course it hasn't. I've just told you. We've lost between 40 and 50 percent of the wildlife across the world. Our method, like many methods of environmental care and conservation, has failed wholeheartedly. Even Sir David has been accused of looking at this environment through rose-tinted lenses. Thankfully, things are changing and they've changed quite rapidly. After Blue Planet, we brought the use of plastic to global attention. That programme worked. And in the aftermath, great things happened. The One Show did an amazing job. They ran an amazing campaign to bring public awareness of plastic wastage in the UK to the forefront of everyone's minds. The BBC made another programme about plastic. They recently won, made one about meat production. I was on TV last night talking about overpopulation. Things are definitely changing. Think of Seven Worlds, One Planet. There was some pretty hard-hitting stuff in that. No doubt about it at all. But we've still got a lot further to go. There's no question about that. Particularly when it comes to production. That's what we've been saying. What have we been actually doing? Well, I'm very pleased to say that BAFTA has got its Albert initiative. We are Albert. And I'm certainly not going to criticise that. 
that's moving in the right direction. It's encouraging people to think about the impact that their productions are having on the environment. It's empowering them to make a difference. It's got guidelines which are set there for people to use and hopefully exceed. It's a good thing. But what about if I was to tell you that I've worked on programmes that have emblazoned the credits with that little logo where instead of not using single-use plastic bottles, they simply move them out of the shop before we turn over? What about if I was to tell you that I've worked on series where I'd been handed more than 270 sheets of paper? That's just me in the course of that production. What about if I was to tell you that I've worked on a program that's used the Albert logo at the end where people were flying home for the weekend for one and a half days. That's not so good, is it? What about if I was to tell you I turned on the TV just a short while ago and saw two camera people flying to a location in a private jet? I mean, come on, people, wake up. That is an open door for enormous and justified criticism. I don't think we've gone far enough. I think Albert is a brilliant start. But how about this? How about we set ourselves a meaningful target where programmes like this, me standing here in Tanzania making a programme about wildlife, are carbon neutral. Uh, what about... Well, some of the productions last two or three years, don't they? So let's be realistic about it. Let's say three years. Why don't we say that in three years' time, programmes like this and all of the others have to be carbon neutral. That would be a good target. I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, it's going to come with a cost. Budgets are getting smaller. They're not getting as small as the wildlife populations out here in the world, the very things which impassion us to come here, get out of bed and try and make quality TV. We can't have our cake and eat it too. It's that simple. And what about the content of what we've been saying? Well, very often I'm told that it's not our job to say that because that's news. That's something that's got to be reported by journalists. So what about the quality of environmental journalism? Well, we've just had an election and I was pretty dismayed by the quality of the journalism, if I'm honest with you. OK, Channel 4 News are definitely flying the flag as a brilliant daily bulletin. Newsnight, excellent. Today programme, fantastic. But for a lot of the time, we were giving a platform to uncontested lies. The BBC infamously said that they wouldn't call Boris Johnson a liar, even when we all knew that he wasn't telling the truth. So what does that make him? You see, I think we've got a bit confused between impartiality and fairness and morals and ethics impartiality and fairness, and right and wrong. Because I was brought up to think that it was wrong to lie. And at this point in time, when it comes to environmental journalism, it's dangerous to lie, because we have to tell the truth. And that's why my idea of journalism is that if someone tells you it's sunny, and someone else tells you it's raining, you don't quote them both, you look out the bloody window and you see whether it's sunny or raining and then you tell the truth about it. You tell the truth. Because the truth is the most essential component of progress. I'll say that again. Truth is the most essential component of progress. Without it, we can't make best informed decisions. So it's critical at this point in time, when it comes to the environment, that we tell the truth. Here's something which isn't the truth. Here's something which is just conjecture. It's an idea that I've got. If there's a history 
if at some point in the future there's enough humans around to be able to look back at this point and judge us, I imagine that they may put our current crop of leading global politicians, people like Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, Jair Bolsonaro and Scott Morrison, in the same category, a similar category, and think about them in the same way that we currently think about Hitler, Stalin and Pol Pot. Because these people have the capacity to lead to the deaths of millions, if not billions, of humans on this planet. If we let them, they have the capacity to become genocidal maniacs because of their inactions, because of their actions when it comes to caring for this, our planet, our beautiful little blue precious planet, the only one that we've got, the only one that we know of in the entire universe. Well, we just can't let them do that. We've got to do something. So what can we do? What have we got the power to do to make a difference? We can shout above their noise. Yeah. We can shout loudly, clearly, honestly, truthfully, peacefully and democratically above their noise. We can tell the truth. Here's my parting shot. If there is a history, then that means that we will all have our personal histories for which we'll be accountable. Imagine this scenario. Imagine at some stage in the future, you're standing in the ruins of your burned out house, scuffing around in the smouldering embers, looking for some precious little artifact. And your child or your grandchild looks up and says, mum, dad, grandma, granddad, through their dust-covered face and their bloodshot eyes. And they say, what did you say at the time when there was still hope? Imagine you're standing in a long line of people in the rain outside a food depot, which ran out of food two weeks ago. And that same child looks up at you through emaciated lips, it says, what did you do at that time when there was still hope? Imagine that you're waiting and in your hand, you have that child's hands and on it, it has no fingernails. And you're queuing to see the world's last tree. And that child looks up into your face and says, did you tell the truth at that time when there was still hope? What are you going to say? Scott. Yeah, all good. Yeah, Sharp, Nick. Yeah. In one. Let's go.
Wow. <laughs> One take. <laughs> oh, I learned my trade on film where it was too expensive to mess up. <laughs> um, let's start with your story, though, Chris. I mean, that is a pretty apocalyptic view of our future. And what did you hope to achieve by that, giving that to us? Well, I think that um, it may well be perceived as an apocalyptic view, but some of the scenes of that story are very real on this planet at the moment. If you were living in southwestern Australia, then you would be scuffing in the embers of your burning house looking for some precious artefact of value to you. Um, and I think that, um, you know, w w it's too cosy for us here at the moment. You know, we've had flooding before Christmas in Yorkshire and people have suffered as a result, but climate change and, and, and what it's exacting on the, on the planet is happening over there, which is why people are not reacting as radically and as urgently as they, as they should here. And um, I think it's desperately unfortunate that when we have the capacity to address the issue, we have the intelligence to do it, we, we're not putting prevention in place and we're waiting to get hurt so that we can cure the problem. And, um, and that's, a, you know, for all of our you know, remarkable assets as a species, that's a, a sad indictment, really. So I, I think that one of the things that has limited our our ability to communicate these issues, our desire to communicate these issues in, in TV, is that we perceive that people have grown too frightened of fear. But we know that fear is a very compelling emotion. It <coughs> motivates action. It's motivated all sorts of great human inventions and transformations. Um, everything from pestilence to disease and war and, 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 and political issues, we've overcome them because they've frightened us. Mm. So I think that using a bit of fear, okay, a bit of science fiction, um, is maybe one of the, the methods that we, we need to not shy away from. I think we have to counter it with hope, and the, the man did catch a fish. There is hope at the end of the story. Um, but we have to get, you know, we, we, we can't deny what's, what's happening out there. And it is terrifying. You know, it does, fri I, it frightens me because I don't want to lose, I'm a bad loser. Um, it frightens me more because, you know, I have a, a stepdaughter who's 25. I can't imagine her world when she's my age. It's always frightened me. Mm -hmm. And now I'm more terrified than ever. Mm. Um, so we've got to do something about it and we've got the power to do it. We've just got to, got to get on with it. But um, climate change was first reported in 1912. So why has it taken us this long to make it a priority, do you think? Well, um, yes, we have known, but our technologies in terms of measuring the climate have greatly increased, and I think, therefore, the integrity of the science has grown and grown, um, and therefore, we can trust in our scientists. Um, climate, weather, it, there are always fluctuations and ambiguities. We've needed to accumulate sufficient data to give us the absolute authority that we now have to say that it's human-induced and we are exacerbating it. And obviously, coincidentally with those studies, we've learned to um, identify what we're doing to precipitate it. So I think that, you know, when I was at university, climate change, from my, my personal perspective, was just being discussed at that point in the 1980s. I think that, you know, our sort of theatre of shame, if you like, doesn't go all the way back to, to 1912. There wasn't broad enough awareness, nor the concise science available. But for some time, we've... Um, We've had that capacity. And then for a long time, unfortunately, the powerful people who are principally responsible for exacerbating climate change have had their paid lobbyists, the climate desires. They're still out there, but they've lost most of their voice, thankfully, now. And, um, and you know, initially, justifiably, they were given a platform. There's two sides to every story. But, you know, that platform was, you know, balanced far more heavily on one side for a long time. And, and that held us back a bit. But we're beyond, we're beyond that now. The vast, the vast, vast majority of people know that climate change is, is real. They can see it being played out in real time, in our lifetimes. And we can measure this biologically as well as meteorologically. Um, and we're seeing those sorts of changes. And I think that the, the, the thing that, you know, again, accelerates the fear for me is that, I, I, you know, in my short lifetime, which is a meaningless quantity of, of time, um, I've seen those changes taking place. And, and my particular focus is obviously natural history. I see springs ar arriving early. I see birds breeding earlier. I see the whole ecosystem going out of kilter. And I look back at my diaries, which I annotated when I was 14, and 
the dates are written on the page and they're two, three weeks different than they are now. And that's, you know, the lifetime of one insignificant naturalist. And yet it, it's happening. But should we still be representing those other views, the other side of the story? No, no. The I, other I, people's I, points of view, I, I No, we very definitely didn't. Uh, th they've had their day. And, and this is, comes back to the, the underlying premise of my piece, and that is that is, this is the time where we have to tell the truth. We no longer have time to enter, entertain the fripperies of those liars and, 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 and the, the things that motivate them. It's too dangerous. You know, we, we're, we're in a, virtually a last stand situation now, and, and we can't be tolerant of those sorts of things. Um, if, if there were any chance that they were right, then the answer would be yes. Because science is only produces a fact um, at a certain point in time. Science is ongoing, but at this point in time, we know exactly w w what's going on and pretty much how, how, how dangerous it is. So I see these people now as a, as a very dangerous force. And in fact, although I've, since I've you know, been doing social media, I've never blocked anyone. I had this sort of idealistic idea that if I have a voice, then everyone else is entitled to raise theirs in opposition if they see it fit. But I've, I've determined that when I get round to it, I'm going to block all of those climate change deniers from my social media because I see them now as nothing other than a, a very, very dangerous force for, 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 for wrong. I agree. Uh, the Natural History Museum this week has just announced a new programme because we are in a planetary emergency, as they put it, rather than a climate emergency, with, I think, one million species at risk of extinction. Mm. Um, and they're wanting to do this to inform people in order to empower people. Do you think we in the production community are doing that yet? I think we've made a... I mean, as I said in the film, you know, in the last few years, we've seen a radical transformation with programmes that I've made myself and programmes that I know will be in production. I listen to the BBC news bulletins and they are going to run this year, um, uh, you know, a, a continuing thread on, 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 on climate. I'm, I'm hoping they're going to put the truth into that a, 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 as well. Um, but no, I think that we've, you know, we, we, it's tempting to say we came late to the table, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy for anyone to jump on a bandwagon so long as it's moving in the right direction. And we've made some very powerful programming. There's no doubt about that. I was, I, there was one, um, oh, sorry, I was going to sound a bit arrogant. I said there was one mistake in my piece to camera. Um, there was more than one, <laughs> I know. Um, but there was one, there was one factual error, and, and that is that the programme that the BBC ha has made about population growth is actually going out this evening. And uh, we showed it to a collection of journalists a, a little while back before Christmas. Um, and when it concluded, um, there was no applause. They sat there in shocked silence. Um, it's a bold, courageous, forthright, honest, um, clarion call to talk about this issue. Um, and we, we see these changes, you know, taking place. I mean, obviously, my job, if you like, is to be critical of the pace. I'm trying to drive that pace. It'd be no good me saying everything's great, brilliant. Um, I'm I want it to happen more, more quickly and more forthrightly. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm bound to say that. But no, I think, I mean, again, I drew attention to it in the, um, in, in the, in the programme. When Blue Planet uh, um, instigated the discussion about plastics, that initially was in a niche audience, which is our natural history broadcasting, and we know what that audience is and we know its limitations. What followed on, I think, was, you know, was even more impressive, was the one show. The one show is a popular early evening program that ran a fantastically composed, well thought through, engaging and empowering campaign to highlight that plastic waste issue in the UK. So TV can show that it can do it, but it ought to be integrating these stories far more broadly, far more urgently, and sometimes far more truthfully. And I suppose, how do you go about empowering an audience? Because if you constantly feed them with the the heavy, hard facts, like your story. I mean, your story is depressing and upsetting. How do you empower people? How well, do that's you give them hope? I, I, I wanted to depress and upset you all. So, <laughs> so, so to get your minds in a place where, you know, you, you, you didn't want to envisage that sort of future. You know, I, I, that the purpose of the story was to frighten people because there are tangible aspects of reality in that story. There's no question of that. Um, so we see whales choking on plastic, all of those sorts of things that were, that were integrated. But 
that, yeah, you're, you're right. The critical thing is that at the moment we're doing a pretty good job. I don't say we finished it, but we're doing a pretty good job of ringing the bell and saying we have an emergency. Extinction Rebellion have done a remarkable job over the last year of doing this. They've instigated climate and environment emergencies, not just in the UK, all over the world. They've woken up the world's media. Whether you agree with their methods or not, the result has been successful. The next step is to empower people to implement the solutions. And we do have the solutions. And I think that you know, is something that we need to embrace when we're making our programmes. There was a fear in the past that all environmental programmes, this is going back years, all environmental programmes are going to be too depressing for people to watch. They didn't want that, it was doom laden, so on and so forth. But we've got a remarkable arsenal of technologies and abilities and solutions there. And I think while some of those will need to be implemented at governmental, global level, Many of them can be done by you and I, and those are perhaps the most important because if we as individuals feel that we've made a valid contribution, even collectively if it doesn't make any difference, even if collectively that action wouldn't save the world, what it does is empowers us to feel that we are part of a solution, not the source of the problem. So we need to approach this on a couple of significant levels. One, the individual, giving people something to do, of which there are a plethora of things to do. The plastic campaign was a case in part. We've seen changes, slow and frustrating, but it's happening. Um, and then, of course, we're talking about the, the governmental level, the, the, you know, the, the, the big level, where we need people to not only care, we've, we've done a brilliant job of making people care, but now we need to lead them to the point where they have to take action meaningful action and that means we have to question governmental decisions when it comes to simple things like oil exploration and fracking you know if we are setting you know targets to be carbon zero by 2050 why are we still investing in oil exploration that won't come online until just before that why are we investing in you know uh, further carbon fuel based uh, expansion with fracking it's, it's an ab absolute madness so we have to get people to a point where they would take action to, to quash that in a peaceful, democratic way, because we still live, for, well, do we? I don't know. But anyway, we're meant to, we're, we're meant to live in a you know, peaceful, democratic society where we can affect things through um, you know, non-violent direct action as, as, as we do when we take to the streets. Um, and the, the other thing is I think that we have to respond to the, to the young people who, after years of silence, have, have found their voice with remarkable clarity and poignancy. Um, and when you have uh, a young 16, 17-year-old girl speaking to the world's leaders, and it's painfully obvious that she's the brightest person in the room, <laughs> that is enormously important for the youth of the world. And so we have to start handing over you know, some of our uh, position to them. We have to give them a platform because they are brave they are, you know, clear um, and simple in their requests. Things which are too complicated for us because we consider the politics of, you know, the, uh, and, and, and risk. They're not interested in that. And that's why Greta, fellow Aspie, doesn't see anything other than black and white. He's able to stand there and tell the truth. Yeah. Um, going back into program making, we produce programs that I think uh, 13 tonnes of carbon are used for every hour of television. That sounds a lot to me. Mm. How do you think we can improve that? What are the things that we can practically do in the program making community to make that better? Well, I think let's say program making and keep it to natural history and environmental TV, uh, you know, pro programs that we're making because basically the vast majority of people that I work with in that field, uh, the reason they're on the team is because they can. They care about the environment, everyone across the board, cameraman, sound man, they're, they're into it. They always have been. It's what allows us to make the, the programmes that we do for the paltry budgets that we get given. Um, <laughs> nudge. Um, <laughs> and, and that is because we're, we're, we're impassioned. So all of those people are a willing audience to, for change. And we have to make those changes. 
And the Albert Initiative is great. It's given a, a, a set of rules and ideas for people to, to um, you know, take on board. Um, but we need to push it further. And I think we need to set meaningful targets. And ours is obviously the genre of TV where we should be taking the lead and showing people how to do this. And I think that the first thing I think is we need better communication. There are lots of people who will find during the course of a production, they will find a method of achieving something which is less environmentally damaging. And they should have a platform to communicate that to all of the rest of us so that we can take it on board. This isn't a competition. You know, our competition is against collective failure and we need that collective strength. So I think uh, certainly as part of that Albert platform, if there was a, a shared forum there where people, even the tiniest things, where productions could come on and say, we've just done this and it worked and, and it's led to this and this and the cost was that, but if you balance it out, so on and so forth. So I think a, a far broader amount of, uh, of cooperation. And we need to change our practices. I mean, I, again, going into the distant past doesn't happen as much these days. We would fly a camera crew all around the world, and there were justified reasons for doing that in terms of programme style and shooting style and so on and so forth. And we all love that because it adds to the quality of our product. But these days, there are capable camera teams, sound, all sorts of other skill sets, all around the world. So we don't have to fly them. We could start to cut down on our flights. And I just think that... As long as we're, from my point of view, moving in the right direction, then we can't be critical of people making progress. You know, that's why I'm annoyed by people moaning about Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson has stood up and spoken clearly um, and broadened the audience when it comes to um, this whole debate, um, and yet people want to needle her because she flies. Well, I don't know how much she flies. I don't know what her attitude to flying is. I don't know whether she carbon offset or she's minimising her flying. I don't know whether she's now choosing projects where she doesn't have to fly as much. But as long as we are all finding our own way at whatever pace we can manifest to make progress, then that's something we have to encourage, not criticise at this point. We need a collective force for good. We don't want division. And so, you know... That's, that's what we've got to do. And I think we have to be creative and realistic in, in our targets. But if anyone in the media should be setting those sorts of targets, it's us, it's, 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 it's me and the productions that I work on. We're the people that really care about this stuff at the forefront. We're the people that have got the data at our fingertips and, and, and really know what the impact is. We have to lead by example. And I think that's a challenge we should, we should take up. And, you know, I, saying, you know, we're going to meet all of those targets, but as long as we're candid and honest about our desire and our capability and our determination, then that's, that's, credi that's credible. And then you talked a bit about, in your film, about the malpractices that you've come across. How have you dealt with that when you've seen those things? Well, you in? don't want to work on a production <laughs> with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know you have, but... <laughs> you you know. have, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, no, I, I think that, do you know what, the interesting thing is that I will sit there and complain about all of those things. I counted the sheets of paper, I deliberately saved all those sheets of paper, I counted them all and then I sent a photograph of the pile with the total to the production. Um, but you know, I'm not the only one, and particularly some of the younger people. Um, and we, at the, Sometimes they mutter, um, and I say to them, don't mutter, come into, the, come into the meeting and tell people what you know and think. We're all there to learn. You know, we've got to change our minds and practices. And any, if anyone wants to instigate that, that's fine by me. But, I mean, just drawing attention to our Springwatch programme, um, you know, significant changes have taken place. So the, the, a lot of the team, are going, we're in Scotland for Winter Watch, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, and they're going by train. I'm travelling by electric car. Um, you know, I'm going to be nagging them like how to go paperless, um, we've cut down the amount of paper, but there's always, you know, it's like there's always progress to be made. So people have got to be needling. It might be annoying, but it's necessary. And, you know, I'll take the flag. And do you think your target that you mentioned in your film of three years is realistic? Is that well, I don't doable? think we have to have realistic targets. Yeah. I think we just have to have targets to motivate people to want to meet them. You know, we are a task-orientated industry. 
we're given very precisely these days a, a, you know, a, a, a design for a program and we're given very precisely a time that we've got to make it and we're given very precisely the amount of money we've got to make it. All of these are fixed parameters and in order to satisfy those and maximise the quality which we all strive for, we all try to meet our task orientated goals. Um, of course we don't, you know, we never score 100%, that's the way things are. But if you're aiming for it, then that's extremely motivating. So I think we set those targets and we strive to meet them and that would see significant progress. Otherwise we sit back and we potter along doing what we're, the moment, what we're doing at the moment, which is making sporadic you know, uh, progress. Whereas if we all came together as an industry and said we're going to, well, it's not just about the production, it's going back to telling the truth as well, but you know, if, we were going to, if we were going to do that, then um, I, I don't know, I just feel that it, at, at the end of the piece, it's about our consciences. You know. I've, I, I didn't know about your tonnes of CO2 a few years ago. Now I do. Well, I've got to make a decision about how I change my mind, how I deal with that. I've got to explore what avenues there are to ameliorate it, and if it can't be done, then I have to stop it. And those are decisions that we're all faced with. So I think that rather than knee-jerk and just cancel all the programming, um, that, we, um, that we actually just step up to the plate and work as hard, as rapidly as possible to meet set targets which are deliberately ambitious. Going back to content, um, I think it's starting to happen, but do you think it should happen more? That there should be content going across all different genres in entertainment, in drama, how, how to get the message across better? What do you think about Oh, no, definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it, we're all guilty of preaching to the converted a lot of the time. We know our audiences very well. We make programmes that are tailored to fit that audience. But um, we, we should, of course, be integrating this into, um, into, into every aspect of, of media. It has a very powerful capacity to communicate um, for good and for bad. Um, but we want to concentrate on the good. So, yes, we need the inventiveness and the imagination um, to make sure that we these discussions and the you know are at the forefront of all of those things you know they, they need to be in in all of our soaps you know we, when you think about the history of the soaps and how much um, controversy or publicity they've courted through integrating social ills um, they've dealt with all sorts of things going back a long time now from you know homophobia racism all of the other nasty aspects of the world um, and they brought these to public attention they've been lauded for doing so well come on the, the single most dangerous thing that threatens us you know is our climate and environment emergency um, emergency that it, it should be you know I'd, I'd love to see an extinction rebellion banner across Albert Square to be quite <laughs> honest with you <laughs> I'll go and hang it up. <laughs> <laughs> what about in the news? Because obviously the Australian bushfires have featured really heavily in the news recently. Do you think that's going to move the debate on? And I mean, obviously what's happening in Australia has to move the debate on because it is happening in Australia. Yeah, it's happening in Australia. But again, you know, I, I would say that, you know, I'm really critical of news and journalism at the moment because of what's happened through the election. Um, but I would say that aside from the telling the truth and platform for lies stuff, um, it needs more imagination. Um, you know, what, what the reports that I've seen of those fires have failed to achieve is transporting me to that environment. It's still difficult for me to imagine what it's like to be there because the reports are someone standing, gives you facts and figures, it's a bit of flames behind, so on and so forth. I can't smell it. I can't feel the heat. I'm not sweating watching it. And when I think back to some of the more original news broadcasting that was done, and we spoke earlier about a series which had a very powerful effect on me. It was called um, Today in Sarajevo. It was broadcast between 92 and 96 when the Balkan conflict was on. And it ran, as I recall, from 8.45 to 9 o'clock every night of the week. But it was filmed from Sarajevo. The city was under siege at that time. And, but the film was shot that day and edited, and it was everyday stories of everyday people in a very not everyday situation. And I would come home and I would turn it on, and I would watch, on one occasion, uh, an elderly lady uh, trying to cross a street under sniper fire. And I would think, 
I, I was watching a kestrel while she was doing that, you know? And, and the proximity of time bridged the geography of distance. And it took me onto the streets of Sarajevo. And that programme was cumulative. You watched it every day. Different people, different scenarios. Not always violent or dangerous, but always depressing. Um, and it really put me in contact with that conflict. And it had a profound eff effect, effect on me. So why aren't we using our creative imagination when it comes to news? Why aren't we making programmes reactively? I mean, we do great programmes non-reactively, but reactively, by coming up with those sorts of ideas, instantaneously putting them out, taking people to the heart, to the core of that inferno, so that we do fear it. Because for us, it's too far away. It's somewhere we've been on holiday or our relatives live. It's like, we can't smell the smoke, let's just carry on business as usual. And so, Again, we have that capacity, the skill set in this room could transform that. Mm. We've got to up our game when it comes to communication. We're the masters of communication, so let's put our foot on the gas. Mm. Um, it's a pun. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there was a recent Albert report that covered, that looked at subtitles over a year across all of the main British channels. And I've got some figures here of words that were mentioned. So Brexit was mentioned 68,816 times over a year. I think I heard all of them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, chocolate was mentioned nearly 33,000 times. And climate change was mentioned just 3,125 times. Now, that report is being redone, and there's a new one coming out this spring and I hope it's changed, but what does that tell us about our society and our programming? That we're not doing our duty, that we're not doing our duty. Um, a similar study was conducted. Um, they looked at um, politicians and how many times they mentioned it, and the stats are pretty much run parallel with that. Um, so, you know, we, we've really got to push, up, push it up the agenda, and, and we have the capacity to do that. We can do it in an informative, um, uh, educational and important way. We, we, we need to change that. We, we are a conduit for, you know, what's ever is happening in the world to, to, to pretty much the whole world now, given all the platforms that we have. And that, to me, rather like the loss of, the tragic loss of wildlife on our watch, um, you know, is, 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 is shameful. We'll be held accountable for that if we don't rectify it. There's no question. Again, history will not look fondly upon us if we've not brought that to public attention. It's not only our job, obviously. The politicians should be talking about it. Um, but in, a, in many ways, we have the, a greater capacity to instigate action through our, uh, uh, you know, our ability to communicate more broadly, even than those politicians. So, yeah, that's a, those are terrifying statistics. Yeah. And that's what motivates people to be angry. That's what motivates people to take to the streets <coughs> in those non-violent direct actions, because that is the result of frustration um, uh, and a disappointment and, and a desire to, to highlight that urgency. And, 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 and what is it when, you know, the uncooperative crusties of Extinction Rebellion have a more positive effect than the collective media of Britain, Europe and the world? Should we be When you think what we've got at our disposal, yeah. and, and it's the elderly, the children, you know, the informed, the peaceful, who've taken to the streets and put this on the map. So we've got to up our game. Do you think there should be a global collaboration of broadcasters where everyone gets together to do something together? I mean, that happens a bit with co-productions, obviously, but something well, more formal. Well, look, we do that. it with sport, don't we, all the time? You know, that mad lunatic distraction to everything else that goes on. Um, but, the, <laughs> but, you know, we have the capacity. The networks are there. And, I, I, and again, I, I hate to sort of be idealistic about it, but if you look back even to the 80s, look at the response that Live Aid made to that famine. Yeah. You know, the famine was horrendous, but it's, I don't mean this in any nasty way, but compared to the catastrophe that we all face now, it was small fry. And yet the imagination of a, a few musicians and the support that they had from the media it was broadcast all over the world, BBC, American, blah, 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 um, was phenomenal. We, we, can, we can do it. Um, we just, again, 
need to exercise that imagination and use the platforms that we have. Just slightly changing the tone, how has punk contributed to your anger or your campaigning? <laughs> well, it still, still does. Um, I think that for me, you know, the whole, that movement uh, allies with a, a lot of the things that we need to do now. Uh, as I recall, because it was a long time ago, um, it was enormously empowering. You know, mid-70s Britain, I came from a large comprehensive, you know, it was pretty, the, the outlook was pretty bleak. You know, I'm not saying it was on the same scale as our climate emergency, but it was pretty bleak. And it was, it was an uncomfortable world to come in to as a teenager when you're developing your social and political awareness. And, uh, and for me, outside of the personal uh, strengths that it gave me, um, it taught me that firstly, anger isn't something to be frightened of, it's something to be turned into a creative force. There's no point in screaming and shouting. You've got to find a means of being heard and you've got to find a means of making that into something positive. The second thing was to never trust authority. Never believe what you're told. Always test it. Listen, but then test it and find out what the truth is. And then the third thing was never take no for an answer. If someone says no, what's their agenda? And if they do keep saying no, then you just keep saying yes. And if they close the door in your face, you kick it down. <laughs> it, it instilled an enormous amount of determination, basically. And combined with a personal sense of injustice, now, uh, I was going to say slightly more moderate age of 58, and I'm not that much more moderate, I seem to be more angry than ever. Um, well, my methods have changed. Um, then yeah, I continue to use those mantras which I took from, from that movement. And making the programme that we put out was joyous because so many of the people that I met, um, I mean, I knew some of them, but others I met, um, re reciprocated that. And it had informed and driven and shaped their lives and they were still getting out of bed now, trying to make a difference, doing it themselves, not waiting for someone else to fix the problem, but just getting up and trying to fix it themselves. It's just so heartening. And it, interestingly, in the uh, documentary, when we were asking what they thought any contemporary um, parallels with punk were, they all said it's, it's, it's the youth climate strikes, it's Extinction Rebellion, it's, it's being so frustrated, you know, that you're going to get on and do something. And, and that's what we did back in 1977, whether it was art, fashion, music, politics, all the campaigning we did against racism and, and everything else. So that I think there are real clear parallels. And it's not the music so much now, music's changed, but it's the attitude, and that's what we wanted to explore in that programme. And I, I enjoy, Well, I, I suppose the, the key thing was, it, uh, uh, by the time we finished shooting it, I realised I wasn't the, the only sad old bastard out there <laughs> <laughs> still listening to The Clash. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.